I'd like to ask um, Mr. George Habistro if he could lead us in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you again for just this time you've given us to be together as your people, Lord, and study your word, Lord. I just thank you for Pastor John and his teaching of your word, Lord. Uh, just uh, let your Holy Spirit come upon him, Lord, and, and help us to uh, focus on what it is that you would have us to learn from this, Lord. I just thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to begin by summarizing some of the points. Um, these were more um, discussion kind of questions or, or, or thought kind of questions. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen with the homework um, from last night. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 7. Paul describes an excursion, excursion to the third heaven. Discuss what is meant by the third heaven. Everybody got that. Uh, we, we spend a lot of time in first, second, and third heaven. Second, most Bible teachers believe that the man who was caught up in the third heaven was Paul himself. Most of us got the fact that even though Paul refers to this person in third person uh as the text as the passage goes on we realize he's just being very humble and not referring to himself but uh, he transitions to first person it's uh i was the one that got the thorn in the flesh and uh so starting about verse five of that passage it becomes obvious that he's writing about something that happened to him um there's a suggestion that it was when he was stoned and left for dead um he described uh, the location as paradise. Um, and we said that the purpose of the thorn in the flesh was, um, was to keep him humble. Uh, after, imagine what it was like to be in the third heaven. As a matter of fact, the entire time he's making sure to not elevate himself uh, because of this revelation. Um, part two describes paradise so we said a walled garden or a beautiful garden uh, so it describes this beautiful um uh bucolic uh scene in heaven um paul in second corinthians and john in revelation 5 described going to this present heaven this suggests that it's a place however more is written about who we would be with in heaven rather than its location so many people had great answers uh, uh, for why this is the focus of scripture. But one thing that was that I especially liked was um, one of the answers was, you know, if you spend your whole life living for Jesus and longing to be with him, then heaven itself will be being with him. If you really want nothing to do with the Lord, if it's really more important what the scenery is or what, uh, what I'll be wearing, what will look like, all those other kind of superficial things, uh, then um, that really isn't going to be the focus of heaven. It's going to be being with our Lord and Savior, the one who saved us, right? Um, and it's interesting that people that reject the Lord and Savior and really have no interest in being with him, they, um, they actually spend eternity without him. Um, and then we had the inhabitants of heaven, all the humans that have, um, have trusted in Christ, um, those who have died before our time were already there. Uh, and um, so that was part in three. And then if we have fingers and to dip into water um, uh, uh, and we'll be face to face with Christ, what does that suggest about our natures in heaven? That we'll actually have bodies. Um, the ancient Greeks taught about separating our soul from our bodies, but uh, the um, description of those that are already in glory is that they actually have bodies. Uh, so while we have a hard time understanding fully what that means, um, the scripture is clear that we will have um, some kind of bodies at, in, when we're in heaven. Uh, so you guys did a great job on the homework. Um, what I want to do is introduce the, um, the lesson for tonight. Um, and um, I'm going to How does God describe the collective or collective destiny uh, for all who believe? Um, what are myths that are dispelled about heaven in the Word of God? How is a, heaven a place of no mores? Will eternity be boring? Uh, is heaven fully comprehensible today? What is Christ's place in the eternal state? 
wanted to begin with a quote from Randy Alcorn, who's written several books on the top subject and given lots of seminars. Um, this is a quote from Randy. No doubt our God is creative. Just look at the world around us. There are over 4,600 recognized species of mammals alone, not to mention the countless numbers of other animals, plants, and insects that span the globe. There are majestic mountains, soaring waterfalls, gorgeous desert sunsets, and oceans teeming with vibrant life. Some people might even refer to a to play a few places on earth as paradise but no matter how beautiful this world is it remains just a shadow of what is to come many of us wonder what the new heaven and a new earth will be like will there be mountains lakes and deserts will there be animals will we eat and drink these are great questions that uh, randy alcorn suggests let's begin with um a couple of discussion questions. I'm going to open it up to you guys. Describe how God's creation may have been before sin entered the world, before the fall. What about people? What about animals? What about vegetation? What do you guys think? What was um, what was the earth like before the fall? Peaceful. Peaceful. What about people? Oh, excuse me. There were people. Is that Marie? Yeah. Hi. Hold the mic just a little bit closer so I can hear you a little better. And there was plants and trees, and we know there was a snake. Yep. What do you think about the people? What were they like before the fall? Sinless. Sinless. What does it mean to be sinless? They had no sin nature. They had no sin nature, so they always did what the Lord wanted them to do. Um, they never wandered away from God's will. Until the fall, uh, they were just, um, they weren't selfish. They looked to glorify God all the time. Uh, they really had no sin nature. No, they didn't want to steal from anybody else. They didn't want to hurt anybody else. Um, they were perfect in every way. What about the animals before the fall? They were friendly. They didn't want to hurt anybody. They were friendly. So could you imagine a tiger that has no desire to eat others uh, and uh, just maybe he's a vegetarian? I don't know. Uh, um, but uh, I don't know how the food cycle uh, worked before the fall. Uh, but um, I'm quite sure that um, mosquitoes were quite different <laughs> in the garden uh, and uh, perhaps wasps and hornets. And we're quite different. How about vegetation? Harry has a response about the animals too. Okay, go ahead. I was saying that the, they were uh, they were friendly to each other. You know what I mean? Like they weren't killing each other. Yeah. You, know. they, you wonder how the food cycle worked in all that, but God, you know, God had it all worked out, right? Um, what about vegetation? It's like the lion and the lamb, right? The lion and the lamb. What about vegetation? There was abundance of it. There was abundance of vegetation, and it was uh, the fruit was perfect, right? Didn't have any bad harvest. <laughs> Go ahead, Harry. I was saying, I, I think a lot of the uh, vegeta vegetation was edible. Yeah, yeah. What do we know about the tree of life looking into the future a little bit? You could eat from it. You could eat from the tree of life, right? And it has, how often does it have fruit? Is it every month? All every the month. time. Every, a new every month. It, it, every month. It, the suggestion is it has a different fruit every month. Could you imagine a tree that just... Um, Basically, Jim was right as well. Just <laughs> Excellent. Um, when you hear the words new heaven and new earth, what do these terms suggest about our eternal home? A new heaven and a it new was heaven earth. on earth. Everything was perfect. Yeah, so what's a new heaven like and a new earth? 
better than the original. Okay. What happens when we get a new car? Everything works. <laughs> Got a good smell. Got the new car smell, <laughs> right? Uh, everything's working, hopefully, unless there was a mistake at the dealership, right? Or at the factory. Uh, but uh, the air conditioning works, the radio works, everything works. Um, it, does it have any correspondence to the old car? It's still a car. Has four wheels and a windshield, right? Uh, uh, it's newer, it's not worn out, it's not uh, messed up, uh, it's in perfect condition. Um, but it, there's something about the new car that reminds us of the old car in that it has four wheels and it drives, has a speedometer. Maybe the speedometer in the old one doesn't work, uh, but in the new one, everything is ship shape. Uh, so a new earth, what does that suggest about a new earth? Not only that it'll be new, everything will be new, but not only that, what will, what will be, it's good. Not only that it's new, not only that it's perfect. Not going to wear out. Not good. It's not only that it's not going to wear out. It's not going to be tainted by sin. And not, even more than just tainted by sin. And it's going to be in perfect unity with God. All those things, it's going to be true. But one other thing is true. It's going to be like our old earth, just perfect and new. So do we have mountains in the old earth? Do we have uh, valleys? Do we have streams? Do we have canyons? Uh, the new earth is going to be like our old earth, earth but new, brand new and perfect in every way, right? Um, so this gives us a little glimpse. I mean, if, he, if it wasn't going to be a new earth, he would have used another term, a new place. Okay, if it was going to be one big cube, um, and that was all that was going to be there, um, then he would say the new cube. Okay, but he actually, of all the words, he picks a new earth, a new heaven and a new earth. Um, and so this earth is going to be like the old one, but brand new. Um, so all the things that we love about our current earth are going to be there. Can you imagine walking in a, just a, a beautiful green field uh, with no allergies and just enjoying, uh, you know, enjoying a, a new earth? Uh, that's what it's going to be like in the new heaven and the new earth, right? Um, so uh, not just that it's new, but it's earth. Uh, so it kind of reinforces that the new heaven and the new earth are actually it's actually going to be a place, the new earth. Um, let's take a look with us at the scriptures. Um, 2 Peter 3, verses 3 through 13, we'll just begin with uh, the Apostle Peter. Know this, first of all, that in the last days, mockers will come with their mocking. Uh, have they arrived? Have the yeah. mockers arrived? Uh, absolutely, they're here, right? <laughs> Following their own lust, yes, they're here. And it's is saying, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all continues just as it was from the beginning of creation. For when they maintain this, it escapes their notice that by the word of God, the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and by water through which the world at the time was destroyed, being flooded with water, but by his word, the present heavens and earth are being reserved for fire, kept for the day of judgment and destruction of godly men. What is the error in assuming that the world will continue the same way that has been going since creation? What's the error in that? It'll be cleansed. Yeah. The error was sin. Amen. So God's creation was perfect. Right. And what we do, what uh, the natural scientists do is he applies science to the world and he looks at all the things that have happened while they were alive, maybe when the scientists before them were alive. As long as we've been taking data, they make they take all that data and they make their predictions about the future. 
Who would have predicted how 2020 was going to go? <laughs> nobody could have. Nobody could predict what 2020 was going to be like, right? Um, I don't think anybody did. Uh, the closest person was perhaps our president when he saw what a mess was coming over from uh, from China. Uh, but um, nobody could have predicted what our our, our year was going to be like this year. Um, that's the the flaw that man has is that he keeps that he thinks everything just goes along just so so and that's the way it's always been and that's the way it's always going to be that's the flaw and what peter pulls out as perfect uh, explanation of this is that once the world was destroyed by what once the world was destroyed by what Water. They're, all, they're water. all saying water, just so you know. Water, right. Good. Uh, they, uh, um, once the world was destroyed by water. So if you're going to use natural processes and go back, at some point, all your scientific models fail unless you bring in the flood. Let me give you an example of that. Um, I'm going to show it to you. You don't have to read all the details, but I'm going to show you a website. Uh, it's called the Days of Answers in Genesis.org. And let me share this with you. One of the things that, one of the places that Carol and I went that was absolutely beautiful was near the Grand Canyon. And there's six pieces of evidence about the Grand Canyon that nobody can explain except for those that believe in a flood. Evidence number one, fossils of sea creatures are found high above sea level due to the ocean waters having flooded over the continent. So the scientists have no description of how fossils of deep sea creatures are found in, embedded in the rock in the, um, in the, grand, in the hills around the Grand Canyon. Um, evidence number two, the rapid burial of plants and animals. There's extensive fossil graveyards that preserve uh, fossils and they have uh, billions of fossils that were contained in layers of rock de deposited very quickly. They had evidence number three, rapidly deposited sediment layers spread across vast areas. There are sands that are normally found along the beach in New Jersey and other places and other sea uh, coast areas are found in a strata of dirt that is just below the surface of the Grand Canyon. Uh, they're, they're called the Coco Nino uh, sandstones, and there's no description of how those sands got to uh, Arizona <laughs> and uh, the Grand Canyon. Uh, they have sediment transported long distances uh, and no description of how they got there. Um, there's no erosion uh, uh, between strata which would indicate there's supposed to be billions and billions of years between the strata, but there's no erosions. There actually are trees that have been planted that the tree is actually um, uh, covers three or four different strata of rock, and there's no explanation of how a tree could be buried in five, four, three or four strata of rock. And evidence number six is many strata laid down in rapid succession. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, rock doesn't bend, as we know, but rock actually is formed in right angle uh, at times, um, and it's right in the Grand Canyon area. Uh, so as a matter of fact, the only explanations of the Grand Canyon involve um, the flood. Uh, there's no adequate e explanation of how this this, these two plates got riveted apart to form the Grand Canyon. If you believe that the Colorado River went through all these strata of rock and left the Grand Canyon, uh, I have some swamp land that I could sell you. I actually do have some swamp land in Florida that I could sell you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> but um, natural man makes the mistake of saying, Everything the way it's gone the last 50, 100, 200 years, as long as we've been taking measurements, um, that's how it's going to go forever. That's where man makes his mistake because he doesn't realize that God does things quickly, catastrophically, like the flood that totally changed the 
face of the earth like that. And one day he will do that with the, the earth. Uh, it's not, uh, by the way, can we be absolutely sure uh, that the world is not going to be going to be destroyed by flood? Yes. Okay. We have God's word on that, Everybody, right? Yes. yes. Every time we see the rainbow, we are uh, remembering the promise that God said he'll never destroy the world again by a flood. So every time I hear a global warming person talking about, oh, there's going to be floods and it's going to cover all the cities, I remember the promise of the rainbow, right? Um, so let's continue. Verse 8. But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any to perish, for all to come to repentance. We, I hear people quote this verse all the time. In this context, what is, what is Peter saying? About time. The Lord knows no time. He has no time. Yeah. A th when he says a thousand, uh, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day, he's saying, we look at a thousand years and we think, wow, what a long time. God looks at it and says, you know, uh, he, just, he just came two days ago. Okay. Uh, and this isn't a mathematical equation. It's an idiom. It's an idiom to describe that. For God, God invented time. He doesn't need clocks. Um, he is outside of time. Uh, so when he makes a promise, he's going to fulfill it. And it doesn't matter if it takes 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years. Whatever he makes a promise, he is going to fulfill it. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so the fact that he hasn't come just yet doesn't mean anything. Because when God says he's going to do something, he's going to do it. So that's really what, what, um, what uh, <coughs> Peter is saying. What seems like God's slow slowness is actually revealing what qualities about his character. What is he revealing about his character in his perceived slowness? Mercy. Mercy. Uh, uh, Sharon, you were going to say something? Mercy. Uh, slow to anger. Mercy. Slow to anger, his patience, his long suffering. Aren't you glad that God is long suffering with us? Um, the first time I sinned, it should have been whoosh, lightning bolt, and I'm taken out to, uh, to destruction, judged and taken out to destruction. But he was long suffering with me, and he still is long. He's long suffering with America. Can you say amen to that? Amen. I, mean, I might have judged America by now. Uh, he's been very patient with our country. He's been long suffering. So just the fact that he doesn't work in our time frame doesn't mean he's not going to fulfill all his promises. He's absolutely going to fulfill every single promise. But let's take a but God has the advantage of the long view. He keeps all of his promises, but he does so on whose time pit table? Your timetable? Nope. My timetable? He always goes. I mean, it's his timetable. His timetable. Okay. Um, amen. Uh, let's go to verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in which the heavens will pass away with a roar and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat and the earth and its works will be burned up. So will the earth be destroyed by a flood? No. They're all saying no. It's going to be destroyed by fire. Since all these all things are to be destroyed this way, in this way, what sort of people ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which um, the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat? God's word makes a bold prediction. The heavens will pass away one day, be destroyed by burning. The earth will be destroyed with intense heat. The earth will be destroyed by fire there will be great destruction of, uh, and why would you why would god destroy this beautiful world that we live in have a better one yep 
evil. He's going to make it even better. Because of evil. It's, it's all tainted by sin, right? So he's just going to, it's sort of like, um, um, what is that? Uh, company got junk. Okay. <laughs> he's going to make it disappear. Okay. All the stuff's going to go away. And then he's going to have a new heaven and a new earth uh, made for us. But according to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. This new earth will be perfect in every way, but the thing that makes it a brand new characteristic is that righteousness will dwell in it completely. There'll be nothing but righteousness there. That's why he's purifying the world. People wonder, how could God send somebody who rejected him to the lake of fire? It's because he's never adopted God's righteousness, and heaven is reserved, the new heaven and the new earth, are reserved for those that have his righteousness. How do we get that righteousness? By faith. By faith. God gives it to us as a gift, right? There's nothing that we, there's nothing we can do to earn it. God gives it to those who trust in him, right? Um, why would God destroy the heavens and the earth? Peter simply states that God is going to make new heaven, uh, a new heavens and a new earth. It is interesting that Second Peter is written by Peter in 66 AD, one year before his execution in Rome. John writes the book of Revelation on the Isle of Patmos, a quarter a century about a, and a, about a thousand later and about a thousand miles away, essentially at the opposite end of the Roman Empire, yet they describe the same incredible event, the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. Let's turn to Revelation 22. Um, Here we go. Now, it's important for us to get a little context. The millennium is described um, following judgments in, uh, and, and is followed by judgments in Revelation 20. God then makes a bold assertion that uh, of a new heaven and a new earth. God describes the sight of the new heaven and the new earth for the first earth passed away and there is no, was no longer any sea. While the descriptions of the new heaven and the new earth are not given, the focus becomes the holy city, New Jerusalem. Let's read from, um, from the text here. Um, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. This is Revelation 22. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. The old earth and the old heaven pass away. New replacements emerge. So what I'm, the point I'm trying to make is Peter and John are as far apart as you could be. Just a hand, uh, Peter gets executed a year later, and years later, on the other end of the Roman Empire, God inspires John to describe the same exact event. Amazing. Um, and we talked about what the new heaven and the new earth um, suggest. A new heaven and a new earth suggests at least two things. The new earth and new heaven will have a freshness of being new. Anything old and worn will be replaced. The, the terms new earth and new heaven suggest a correspondence, we've been talking about that, with the old earth and the old heaven. These will be new, but they will have some similarities with the old. Otherwise, why would God name it a new earth and a new heaven? If I told you I was buying a new car, and I, I, I was trading an old car. Again, we would see similarities between the old and the new. The new earth will be purged of all the effects of sin. Um, there'll be no longer any sea. The environment and the hydrology will be completely different. No longer any need for evaporation, condensation, precipitation, transpiration, percolation, evaporation. The rain cycle will be completely different. Um, not sure, but... Uh, I think that one of the reasons for the rain cycle is to wash out all the impurities of the air. We won't need that in the new heaven and the new earth. It's going to be perfect environment. It's not going to have to be washed every day because it's, there's not going to be any toxins in the air and, and, um, and needs uh, for washing everything every day. It'll be perfect in every way. But let's look at the name. Amen. Let's go to verse 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of he heaven from God. So this is a new city. 
Um, it's part of this new earth. It's called the new Jerusalem, coming down from the heaven from God, made ready for the bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. What does the name Jerusalem mean? They all said, well, half of them said city of peace. City of peace, Jerusalem. There is a new capital of the new earth. Guess what the new capital is going to be? Jerusalem. The new Jerusalem. Sounds what does it mean? City of peace, I believe. City of peace. City of peace. Uh, John will call this city New Jerusalem, City of Peace, Jerusalem. Um, again, this New Jerusalem will have some things in common with the old one. Gone are the barbed wires. Gone are the AR-15s or 17s or whatever they are. Uh, gone are the uh, roadside bombs. Uh, it, this, it's going to have a name, New Jerusalem, but it's going to be way different than the current Jerusalem. But this will be new and different in many ways. We have noticed most often cited characteristic about heaven is that we will be with the Lord. What does the word tabernacle mean? Dwelling place. It's the dwell dwelling place, right? Uh, and a, a taber to tabernacle with somebody is to dwell with them. So Jesus is going to literally tabernacle with us. Um, he was, man was estranged from God after the fall, and God's plan of redemption is to reunite man with his creator. And everyone that has accepted Christ and trusted in him, he's been reunited with his creator, and the new heaven and the new earth removes all the barriers, and physically Christ is going to be there with his saints. Hallelujah. Um, the tabernacle is a house. God will dwell among mankind. So it's not so much in Jerusalem that we go to God in the new heaven and the earth, new earth. It's actually the opposite. The new Jerusalem comes down. It comes to us. So that new city where we all dwell is going to come down to earth um, instead of us going to heaven. So uh, right now, in the present heaven, we go to where God is. Um, in the new Jerusalem, he's going to make a new earth, and he's going to actually bring the city, uh, the capital city, down. God will dwell among mankind. There will be a tremendous bond, his people among us. And verse 4, notice this verse is after all the judgments are complete. Um, and judgments, you'd have to stay around for um, Doctrine of Heaven 2 to get to the judgments and the resurrections. Uh, but uh, that's part of Doctrine of Heaven 2. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, and no longer be any mourning, nor crying, or nor pain. The first things have passed away. Uh, we describe um, the new earth as a place of no mores. <laughs> no more tears, no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. Uh, all the first things have passed away. So if you have a little ache, I mean, you have an ache in your back, or your knees are kind of worn out, uh, or you wake up and you ache, uh, in your body or you get tired all those things will pass away there's going to be no more of any of that um, and so uh, God will wipe away every single tear uh, from our eyes Amen. there is not a more blessed description of our eternal home it is a place of no more no more tears no more death no more mourning no more crying no more pain some people ask what, what about when we get to heaven and we find out one of our loved ones actually isn't there. At a certain point, we wrap our minds around it, but when there's a new heaven and a new earth, it's going to be no more. It's going to be the people that are there. The people that have chosen to follow Christ are going to be our brothers and sisters, and we're going to be with them forever. Um, they were all part, uh, all the tears, the death, the mourning, the crying, the pain, they were all part of the first things, the old earth, but alas, all of that has passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Hallelujah. Um, and he said, Write, for these words are faithful and true. Who is sitting on the throne and speaking?
God. God is. Um, what do you think the word all means in this sig in this statement? Everything. Everything's going to be brand new. There's not going to be anything that's not brand new. Could you imagine uh, as as fit as um, uh, strong as DG Farmer is? Can you imagine when DG Farmer is brand new in every way? Uh, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be absolutely awesome. Or Liz, or any of the rest of us, uh, that will be brand new. Um, there's all he's going to make all things new. Everything we look at, everything we touch, will be brand new, and it'll stay that way. You know that you can park a car in like the um, uh, the desert, and it'll unless it get co gets covered with sand, it'll be like that 50 years from now. Um, uh, Jim McCartney has a question. That's a little bit of like what heaven's going to be like. Jim. Jim McCartney wants to know if we're all going to be beautiful. I said <laughs> we will, but I mean, there's not much we can do for him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, even Jim will be brand new. That's very good. And all of us. Praise the Lord. God don't make mistakes. <laughs> Amen. Why do you suppose Jesus told John to pen the words, Write these, write for these words are faithful and true. Why do you think he adds that editorial comment right now? Just for us to believe? Yeah, it's, it, first of all, it is true, but it's hard to believe, isn't it? It's, it's faithful. hard to believe. Everything is going to do it. What's that? You know, it's everything he's written is faithful and true. And I think those are two very key words that, especially with what we're going through in today, and we're seeing everything so sporadic around us, right? But God is saying, I'm faithful and true. These things are faithful and true. So what God says he's going to do, guess what? He's going to do it. If it hasn't been done yet, it doesn't mean he's not going to do it. So it's faithful and true. He's going to do it. Yeah, and, and the other thing about it is... Um, Pastor John. Oh, well, let me just say one thing and then be right there. Um, every scripture is inspired by God. It's all inspired by God and inerrant. So this is just as inspired as John 3.16. I'm trusting in John 3.16 for my salvation to go to heaven. And just as inspired, just as inerrant is the word that God's going to make a brand new heaven and a brand new earth. And even though it exceeds my imagination, how he's going to do that and how wonderful it's going to be. And it gets, it blows my mind to think about it. He puts in here, write this because it's faithful and true. It's just as true as every other scripture in the Bible. Um, DG. Uh, Joan had a comment. Okay. And then I have one afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Did she, did she, I don't think he heard you. Oh, she forgets what it was. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, that when the Lord returns, the second coming, on his thigh is written faithful and true. So, Amen. And a reference to that as well. Amen. The Lord is faithful and true. And Joan, guess what? When we get to heaven, we're going to have perfect, starting in eternity, we're going to have perfect memories from then on out. We're never going to forget yeah. anything. It's going to be awesome. Um, so... We see the delight of God that to make all things new. And just when the reader is wondering, could all this be true? Then he says, these words are faithful and true. Verse 6, then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who has thirst from the springs of water of life without cost. And he who overcomes will inherit th these things. And I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. What does the title, the Alpha and the Omega, suggest to you? And they all said beginning, beginning and the end. end. What does that mean? He has no beginning and he has no end. He is all. 
in your hand. Alpha means he's the, alpha is like you're the lead dog, like you're the leader. The original the, alpha male. The king of the pack. It starts with him and it ends with him. He's the, yeah. he's the he, first and the last and there's no one else. And there's first and the last, no one else. Uh, before there any, there were, before anything was, he was there. And when creation began, he created all things. When all things are made new, he is the one that's going to do it. He is the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He started everything, and he's going to be there when it's all done. The only difference is before he started creation, who was there? Before he started creation, who was there? Himself. Spirit and the, son. the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were there before creation. Mm -hmm. Then he creates everything, and it runs its course. At the end of all time, who's going to be there? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But who else is going to be there? We are. All of us. Us. Uh, so um, awesome, awesome principle. Uh, he is the Alpha and the Omega. Um, he's the first and the last. He will be there to remake the world. He made the first world, and he will be there to remake the world and heaven. He will purge those who rejected his salvation, and the new heaven and the new earth will be reserved for those who remain. Verse 9. Then when the one of then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven of God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like very a very costly stone and a stone of clear jasper. It had great and, a, a great and high wall with 12 gates and the gates, the, um, and at the gates 12 angels and the names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, three gates in the north, three gates in the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. In the eternal state, do we go to heaven or does heaven come down to us? Heaven comes down to us. The newer Jerusalem comes down. In eternity, we don't go up to heaven. Heaven comes down. John is running out of words to describe what he sees. Brilliant, high wall. Uh, by the way, the brilliance he's describing. Why the high wall? What is the symbolism of a high wall around a city? John says no enemies can get in. Yeah, it's security. It's going to be a safe place, right? The city is going to be a safe place. And in the ancient world, it always was pictured as high walls. So this is going to be a safe place. It's going to have gates, but what's going to be true about these gates? They're always going to be open. Because <laughs> there are not going to be any enemies around, right? What's the significance of the names on the 12 gates? Yeah, I thought about that. Um, it's a, I thought that, you know, it all started with Abraham and his faith. You know, so if, without his faith, then there would be no way to get to get to heaven. So I thought that the twelve gates were, were you know, representative of the the twelve tribes, and that all stemmed from Abraham. Awesome, awesome. Um, they do stand for is all of Israel, and they represent all those who believed in Christ before the cross. Right? That's the twelve. Um, the twelve tribes. Right? Uh, and there were some before the nation of Israel, but all those before the cross are represented. And then, of course, the 12 apostles stand for all those that have accepted Christ after the cross, right? Uh, so, in a sense, these names, the 12 and the 12, uh, share that this is the complete kingdom of all the believers from all time. Um, yeah. Do you think Paul's name is going to be amongst the 12 apostles? Absolutely. I believe that. Yeah. Yep. No, Mattathias no. is going to step aside and Paul's going to be the 12th apostle. Right. Okay. The one born out of season that replaces Judas Iscariot. Yeah, I used to say it was going to be Jerry Falwell. It's going to be huge. And Jerry Falwell. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> when I was a freshman at Liberty, I remember like my uh, friends saying, "Hey, do you think the twelfth name would be Jerry Falwell?" Okay. <laughs> that's that's oh, freshman yeah. years. A little li Liberty humor, humor, right? We, we've come a long way. All right, verse fifteen. What's that, uh, no, Carol? I'm, saying Paul. I'm sorry. I thought I was saying I thought it would be um, Paul replaced Judas. Paul replaced Judas, but they had an election when God and well, this is right. not part of the course, but. God told them to go to uh, Jerusalem and wait. And what did they have when they got to Jerusalem? Right. They had a business meeting. They, and they, they called the 12th apostle uh, instead of waiting for God to send his 12th apostle. So um, anyway, we, that'll be another debate for another time. Her, um, verse 15. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as its width. And um, he measured the city with a rod 1,500 miles in length and width and height, which are equal. So even though the world's not gonna be a cube, the city of Jerusalem is gonna be a cube. It's gonna be literally a cube 1,500 mm -hmm. miles that's the distance from here to Denver, okay? Just to give you a little idea, here to Colorado yeah. is 1,500 miles. Uh, it's going to be that wide. Then it's going to be that long. It's going to be that high. Um, and there are all the dimensions of the city are going to be equal. Uh, so that's a cube, a divine cube, right? That's, that's Jerusalem, correct? That's the New Jerusalem. Will there be enough believers, enough room for believers in all ages? New Jerusalem will be a cube. One side of distance is from here to Denver. The width will be the same. The height will be the same. If each of us had a space that was one mile long, one mile wide, one mile high. So that's George's Carol gets one mile by one mile by one mile. That's your space. There would be enough space in that one city for four billion people. Uh, wow, that's big. If each person um, uh, space is a half mile by a half mile by a half mile, there is enough space for 32 billion people, more than the population of the earth for, for all recorded history. Uh, so there is going to be plenty of space in the New Jerusalem for all believers to come and go. Uh, there'll be a whole world, but that will be headquarters. And he measured, verse 17, a wall, 72 yards, uh, according to human measurements. By the way, why is he measuring this city? So, so real quick, I have a question for you, Pastor John. Sure. So uh, if each person gets a, a mile by a mile by a mile, we're going to have miles up in the air where we're not really on the ground, huh? Yeah, and we might be able to transport. Jefferson's, right? Not the, what was that? What was that? Yeah. No, not the Jetsons. Like we, the Jetsons. we will, we won't need jetpacks uh, either. Uh, That's awesome. But uh, yeah, I mean, God knows all the answers to all these questions. But yeah, um, it's going to be uh, uh, absolutely incredible, and nobody's going to have fear of heights. Um, but but I, I asked the question: Why? Why is he measuring this? Jim Hartley said, just think about jumping into the pool from uh, up there. <laughs> uh, George Haberstrow, why would God measure this holy city, New Jerusalem? <laughs> you just finished our sound booth, right? Oh, to make sure it was perfect size. Well, what did you do before you cut one piece of wood? God measures it so we're not so if this were figurative if this just was a story if it was allegory and it really wasn't a real place you couldn't measure it could you but he actually measures it which tells us this is going to be a real city it's not a fantastic um, 
story. This is going to be a real city. You can measure it. You can touch it. It has the length. It has width. It has height. All the things that are physical have length and width and height. So it will be with the New Jerusalem. Every time he measures something in scripture, it's because it's a real entity. Go ahead, Joan. Excuse me. The way I've always read it was that it's not going to be huge enough for all the people that have been saved throughout the ages. Not true. There's plenty of room for everybody. Because the Denver one side and the same size as the United States is not. Uh, it would be, uh, but then it's that it's it's fifteen hundred miles high. Well, that's yeah, but that, 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 it that doesn't to have me, to be one floor. That to me is not yeah, large enough. That you're here and then a mile above yeah. Lizzie's place, right. her, her area, yeah. and then a mile above that is Woody. Uh -huh. This other one would be next to Woody. So <laughs> you need at least a thousand uh -huh. miles. That's just, just, just think about uh -huh. it. Right? 15,000 is right. Uh -huh. Yeah, so uh, well. if, if this was like a high rise, this is on the first floor, Woody's on like the, she's on the next high Okay, rise. well, I guess I haven't been reading it right, but I never. But I never. We all, you can't. You can't you can't that this, not everybody's going to be packed in the city all at one time. Uh -huh. yeah. And Joan, I, you have this. Okay. Just New Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's just the city. Not everybody's living in the New Jerusalem. Is that right? It? Exactly. Okay. But we all could go there at, for festivals and whatever. Um, Joan, you have some homework. I'm going to give you some homework. <laughs> well, and and John, there's also. <laughs> Hold on. The millennial kingdom as well. Like, why would Ezekiel measure um, the new temple? The new temple, right? Like, it's not allegorical. It's it's going to happen. It's real. But Joan, you have homework. Here's your homework. I want you to multiply fifteen hundred times fifteen hundred times fifteen hundred. Okay. I I think it comes out to three point three seven five billion. Uh, so it's almost four billion. Um, cubic miles. So if everybody got a cubic mile, uh, you would, could accommodate a, almost 4 billion people, which is, I'm sure, plenty. It's probably more than enough for all believers from all time, right? Um, and that's if we had a mile by a mile by a mile. Uh, she feels uh, a lot better, John. Okay, great. Um, I teach math, so trust me on that. Okay. All right. But I do want you to try it out and prove that that actually is answered. Um, the wall around the city is, um, uh, and he measured the wall at 72 yards, which turns out to be like a 20-story wall. That was a big, beautiful wall. Can you say amen to that? <laughs> God's going to have a big, beautiful wall around his city. Uh, <laughs> according to human measurements, which are also angelic me measurements. Interesting. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations and stones of the city were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sard sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the twelve gates were, uh, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates had was a single pearl. And the city of the city, uh, the street of the city, was pure gold like transparent glass. Now, uh, let me just say something about this. Imagine the God who made everything when He goes to build something like He's going to build this city. He spares no expense, right? <laughs> He has every gem you could imagine at his disposal, every mineral available. So it's going to be like wa walking into, well, way beyond walking into the finest hotel you've ever been in uh, that's just precious in every way. Um, the wall around the city is 20 stories tall. The materials are precious jewels, streets of gold, pure like glass. Um, verse 22, really important. I saw no temple in it, for the Lord, the God, Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Why no temple? Just, what did, 
What did you do in the temple? God's there. God's there, and why else wouldn't you have a temple? Chris, why no temple in this new heaven and new earth in New Jerusalem? We're going to worship him. Never thought about it. Oh. Um, what, what, is, what is the temple? Yeah, I mean, God dwells in the temple, so he doesn't need to dwell. He's right. there. So the temple, re- the temple is really the new heaven and new earth. When I see no new temple, no temple, no need for any more sacrifices. Mm-hmm. There's no sin. Sin has been dealt with. True. It's, it's long gone. There's no more lambs getting slaughtered on the on the uh, altar. There's no um, holy yeah. of holies with a mercy seat. All that has, all that has been part of the old world. It's all gone. It's been paid uh, by Christ. And it's completely gone. God's made everything new. There's no need for sacrifices. There's no need for a temple. God is with the people. He has already secured all our salvation. And there's no sin. We will be without sin natures. There's no more sin. There's no more penalty for sin. It's all been dealt with, right? Uh, We're on the other side of all the judgments, which is, uh, it's almost beyond our imagination what it would be like to be on the other side of all the judgments. All that is past. No need for a temple anymore. We're home. We're home forever. We never have to worry. We don't. No guilt. No shame. No worries about past failures. All of that is gone. This is the place of no mores. Right? Uh, praise the Lord for it. Pastor John, I wanted to add something real quick. Sure. You remember that the tabernacle and the temple were always representations of the true, right? So the mercy seat and, you know, the uh, altar of incense, they were always representations. They were always shadows. So just understand, you know, also just to add to that. So now when, when New Jerusalem comes down and God tabernacles amongst us, we no longer need the shadows, you know, which was the tabernacle originally and then, then the temple. Absolutely. No need for the shadows because... Uh, faith has been replaced with sight, and hope has been realized. We're in the new Jerusalem, the new, the new uh, heaven, the new earth. Um, and the city has no need for the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of the Lord has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. So the Lamb of God is actually, he doesn't get sacrificed anymore. Uh, he's in heaven, uh, and he's now on earth. And Uh, He's forever the lamb Um, and no need for light. Uh, So what does this mean about seasons in the new heaven and the new earth? No sunrise, no sunset, no seasons. Um, It's always perfect. Uh, It's gloriously perfect. Gloriously perfect. God will have the, the, he'll have the remote. Those of you that think it's too cold in the sanctuary some Sundays, he's going to be holding the remote. And it's going to be perfect for all of us, right? Um, The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there will be no night there, its gates will never be closed. And um, they will bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names were written are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Why will there be no need for us, sun or the moon? Jesus is our light source. They're saying, they're, the, glory they're saying the glory of God shine. That the glory of the Lord. Uh, so what does this suggest about clocks in the new heaven and the new earth? These things control the earth. We're not in the no, earth. There's no time. We, uh, we throw away all our watches in, on this first earth because there's not going to be any more time that, as we measure it. Uh, it's beyond our imagination. We think of just going on and on and on and there's no sunset, and oh, I got to get stu- the, the last five things done today because it's due tomorrow. Uh, you don't have any of those deadlines uh, because there's no clock. 
to do those days. It, it, they're wonderful not to have any deadlines. The deadlines were part of the old world, right? Um, um, and the, the weather will be absolutely perfect at, at all times. Um, I don't think so. You don't have to worry about college. Uh, <laughs> Revelation 22. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the middle of its street on either side of the river was the tree of life, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. So this could be 12 different kinds. So one month it's going to be an orange tree. The next, th next month it's going to be a, a banana tree. The next month it's going to be a pear tree. And they're going to have different fruit, but he's going, to, uh, he's going to have brand new fruit in heaven. And every month there's a brand new fruit on the tree. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Um, there were no longer any curse. The, and the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it. And his bond servants will serve him. They will see his face. They will actually see his face. And his name will be on their forehead. Jesus' name is going to be right here on my new forehead. Uh, and there will be no longer any night. There will have no need for light for the lamp uh, of a lamp nor light of the sun, because the Lord will illumine them. They will reign forever and ever. How long does that last? Forever and ever. That's awesome. Without end. Um, what does the, this water suggest about our thirst in eternity? Jim said it will be quenched. Yeah, we're not going to be thirsty anymore. Um, what were the symbols of God connected with the tree of life? Adam and Eve were not allowed to eat from the tree of life. Why not? They would live forever. They would live forever, but everybody would eat. 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 What's that? It was important no good for they would live forever in, in the same state they were, which was condemned. Yep, so they couldn't eat from the le But when we get to heaven, new heaven and new earth, We'll be able to eat from the tree of life every single day if we live. Well, everything, what, I wouldn't call them days. Uh, Jesus says, the water I give you, if you drink it, you'll never thirst again. The two symbols are fruitfulness and healing. There will be, uh, there would have been, uh, they would have been eternally fallen if they ate of the tree of life in the garden. God desired that they may come to know God through faith so they could enjoy eternity as saints of God. Revelation 21, 11. Does somebody have a comment? Rose had a comment. Go yeah, ahead, Rose. Rose. Go ahead, Rose Post. I was just asking what the other, what the other word was. Sorry. You're cheating over here, don't worry. Which word was that? Well, you said fruitfulness, and I, and I couldn't remember healing. And healing. Yep. Uh, Revelation 21:11 says that the New Jerusalem will have the glory of God. This world, uh, even in its fallen condition, still reflects the glory of God, his invisible attributes. How will it be different in New Jerusalem, the new earth, and the new heavens? Why are the gates open? And, um, okay, anyway. Uh, um, so uh, some of these questions we've already answered. Um, why? Does God have the tree of life in the new heaven and the new earth? In the new earth. Why do you think he places this tree in the new earth? He can eat from it. He can eat from it? Absolutely. Healing of the nations. Healing of the nations. We have Genesis and Revelation. So oh, in, in Genesis, you were not permitted, you know, but in Revelation, we're right. permitted. Right. But you connect, you wrap the whole scripture together from Genesis to Revelation, from the, the tree of life. It, it reminds us of the Garden of Eden, what, what the garden was like before man fell. Um, so the new world will be like the paradise that Adam and Eve lived in. The only problem is there's no possibility of a fall. There's no possibility of separation from God. There's no possibility for sin. But all the wonderful things you could imagine about the first garden 
are going to be true of that new earth. And so to remind us of that, God puts a tree of life in both places so we can connect Revelation with Genesis. A lot, a lot, a lot of uh, teachers teach that too, John, that um, the new heaven is a, an Edenic environment. You know, but what you said, it's without a potential of fall. Right? Exactly. Garden of Eden had the potential to fall, and we did fall, right? In the new heaven, there is n there's not even a potential. Like, that, that's one of the biggest things. There's not even a potential to sin. In yeah. It won't even occur to us anymore. We, will have a, we won't have a sin nature. We'll have um, just the desire to please God. That would be awesome. <laughs> My mind wanders all the time. So. Let's look at Isaiah real quickly before we go. Isaiah 65, 17 through 18, one of the passages we started our study off um, four weeks ago. Um, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. By the way, notice all of those are plural and then a singular new earth. We won't get into that right now, but every time it's referred to as new heavens and a new earth. Um, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. So this is how many years before Peter wrote, how many years before John wrote? 700. 700 years. It's over 700 years. When you add in the apostolic period and so forth and so on, it's over 700 years, maybe closer to 800 years before and they say the same exact thing. Praise the Lord. That's the inspiration of scripture. Um, and the former things will not be remembered or come to mind. You won't even stop and think what the old world was like. Imagine you're living in, in such a world that it's so nice, so perfect, that your old life never occurs to you. <laughs> that's got to be incredible. It's like God does a mind wipe uh, and all of that's gone. And it's just glory. Glory to God. Um, hey, doesn't that answer the question earlier, though, uh, about what, what, what if when we get to heaven and we notice that our loved ones are not there? Like, I, I actually believe that we're not even going to think about that. Yep. Yeah. We're not going to think about that. We're, you know, when, when you're in the presence of God, the only thing you're going to think about is the God that you're in the presence of. Amen. 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 But be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem for rejoicing and her people for gladness. Then in Isaiah 66, 22, for just as the new heavens and the new earth, which I make, will endure before me, declares the Lord, so your offspring and your name will endure. Isaiah 65 and Isaiah 66 mention two different outcomes of the new heavens and the new earth. What are they? Hmm. That there'll be a new creation and that we will all be there with the Lord, right? Amen. Um, some concluding thoughts, and then I want to take a little time and wrap things up tonight, as this is our last class. Um, John MacArthur um, concludes uh, his chapter on the New Jerusalem with these words. I thought they were perfect, perfect way to end the course. As the Apostle Paul wrote, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, height, um, nor height have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians 2 9. The delights of heaven are beyond the scope of our wildest imaginations. But for the believer, we can taste it even now. God hath revealed them to us by his spirit in verse 10. We have tasted of a heavenly gift, Hebrews 6 4. We have a foretaste of heaven. We ought to have our hearts fixedly, fit firmly, fixed firmly there. Unfortunately, many Christians think that fellowship with God and enjoyment of heaven is impossible until we actually arrive there. But the real truth is that for Christians, eternal life is a present possession, not merely a future hope. We are supposed to live as if our hearts are in heaven already. We can commune and fellowship with God even now, not face to face, but through prayer, the study of his word. In heaven, the dif difference will be that we will be with him on a face to face basis, 1 Corinthians 13, 12. 
These then are the consummate blessings of the eternal state. We will be forever in the presence of eternal holy God. We will have intimate, unbroken fellowship with Christ. We will be joint heirs with Christ. We will rule and reign with Christ. The full riches of heaven will be ours to possess and enjoy however we please. Can you say amen and hallelujah amen. to that? Hallelujah. Amen. Do you see why this is so important for the church to uh, to wrap their mind around and, and, and keep their mind dwelling on those things that are above? Um, that's God's desire for us is to not to get trapped in where the devil wants us to worry. I mean, we should take care of our business. There's no question about it. And we should pray for one another. But the world wants to keep us focused on earthly, worldly things. And God wants us to set our our hearts and minds on the things above, right? Um, so um, I, I'm just going to talk real quickly about the final project, and then I'd like to do a really final wrap-up conversation. Um, again, you're going to partner up with at least one more person. You have one last assignment. This is homework number four. Here, here's how it goes. A friend of yours finds out that you took a course on heaven and asks you what you learned. Your job is to summarize, summarize the most important lessons you learn from each week of the course. Uh, I already sent out a link for the homework, uh, and it's called the final project. I'll send it out again. Um, and you will reply with your biggest takeaways you found each week. And I'd love for you to work with some, at least one other person so you can share with each other the, the takeaways from each lesson. What are the most important things that you got out of each lesson? Um, and my hope is that um, if, when we're sharing the gospel or when we're asked for why we have hope in us, uh, that we will have answers on the tip of our tongue related, like what happens when you die? Uh, where do we go when you die? What, what's, what's heaven going to be like? What is the eternal state like going to be like? That we would have the answers on the tip of our tongue when anyone would, would ask, right? Uh, that's the goal of the course is that many of these things many of us knew a lot of these things even before the course it's to have it in ready rem uh, memory so that we can share um, with our family and friends uh, why we have a hope for the future right um, so that's the final project and you can do that whenever you get done um, and i'll be sending a certificate of completion um, for everyone that finishes that that last assignment, uh, so uh, you're not finishing. So you can uh, you can take whatever time you want to, but you don't get a certificate until you're done all the requirements of the course. Um, so I wanted to have a conversation. As you guys know, we um, we ran this course as a pilot course. This was to be the first course of the Friendship Bible School. I'm I would I'd be curious in this. A group setting if some people have suggestions of what what would you uh, like us to do differently in the next course or or some of the features that we definitely should keep when we have uh, a new course I think Pastor Chaz is working on a course I think maybe some Pastor Chris and some of the others are working on some courses uh, for the fall and that's the other question is how many of these things do you think make sense to have in the fall and then the winter and then the spring uh, so let me start with the first one. What what are some things that you would change or re any recommendations that you would make to us to make the courses better? And I'm going to get a piece of paper so I can write all this down. Oh, I got a recording, so I'll let you just talk. Go ahead. Go ahead, Rose. <laughs> um, can, I, can I make a recommendation to do an hour and a half class? where the first half hour is the review from the week before and then the hour is for the class. And the only reason I'm saying it is because we go really fast and um, I don't have time to process like what we're talking about. And I'm still working on what we were just working on and you're on the next one. <laughs> okay, so, I, so number one, I have to slow down. Uh, but homework for the first half hour of class and then um, the next will be an hour of, of, of uh, teaching and discussion, okay? 
who else has a suggestion for the new course, the new courses? Maybe we could spend a little bit more time in discussion. Okay. Not only with you, but with each other in the class about the subjects. That's a great idea. Who else has a suggestion for the courses coming up in the fall or this winter or spring? What are some things we should definitely keep? As much as this pains me to say it, um, <laughs> What you? What did Woody do? I had to prod him every week. You got to get your homework done. <laughs> She's got to keep on. Just again. Well, by by the by the third week, we actually did it. We actually did it like a like on time. We weren't scrambling at the end. Um, but I, I, you know, I think that um, doing the homework was actually very helpful um, because it really. You had to do the homework. You had to really find, you know, you really had to discuss it, um, look up scripture. And it wasn't, you know, oh, well, you know, like you had, a, you had a deadline. And I think that kind of accountability is works for me. Excellent. I didn't think that would be one thing that everybody liked about the course. <laughs> oh, yeah, I liked it. <laughs> Most difficult homework should be maybe the third week rather than the first week okay uh so grade it upward from easy to medium to hard to okay i'm not going to say this i'm not going to say this but liz wanted to bring you an apple in the first class <laughs> <laughs> so be gentler on the first homework okay I way that um when we were learning about the first second and third heaven we had to look up all that scripture and I just like the way that you just took us through so many different parts of the Bible that just like, it really, I guess, just pounded it into our brains, like the meanings of those terms. So by using, um, you know, having us do like a search through the, the, the scriptures, you know, to really uh, pound in whatever the main point was worked for me. Excellent. Pastor John. Chris. I, th I think one of the things that I think maybe we can do next time is um, maybe allow people to take more notes than just give them the notes. Um, you learn a lot more. You know, when you go to college, you know, your prof really doesn't hand out all the notes. And I understand why you did that this time. And you've been a prof for 40 years, so I can't teach you anything. But, you know, it might be a little bit of both. Um, Maybe give them a, a notebook, everybody a notebook, and kind of keep your notes in there. And that way you kind of can share with each other what you missed and, you know, that kind of thing. And I think writing, you learn more, you know, when you're, when you're listening. So it's easy, it's easy to zone off a little bit in this setting, especially online. So I think if we're taking notes, we're a little bit more with it. Just a suggestion. And it could be the same format, Pastor John, just, you know, because you get the, the binders out, just leave some of it more blank. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Absolutely. Like that. Right. Good. Um, last question is, uh, what do you think? What do you think? Joan had Joan something has, real Joan quick. Something. Good. I think it was great. You should keep on going and don't stop. You Amen. think it's too short? Well, I just believe in Bible study and I believe in taking notes and doing whatever we have to do, homework or whatever, because I just think it's a great thing to keep going. Amen. And I love the, I love your reaction the first week. You're kidding me, right? You you're real. <laughs> you're for real, right? So I have a uh I have a question that goes in line. Um would you guys be able to handle doing two courses at the same time? Or do you like just having one course at a time? One. one. Uh, they're all saying one course at a time. Yeah, brain can only take one. Well, there could, there, Chaz, there could be two courses at a time, but just different people take the two courses. Yeah. You know, so it doesn't mean everybody in this group has to take 
do Porsches. John. That makes sense. No, you can't do that. I don't want to have to choose. I don't want to have to choose. I want to take them all. Well, I'm not saying we're going to do it that way. I just said that's a, that's a possibility. Kenny. <laughs> yeah, I, um, I think it's a class longer. Me, myself, I would tend like, okay, I could miss a class. Being short, four weeks, it made me get here every week because it's only four weeks. If I can't do four weeks, then, you know, then there's an issue. But if it's like a six to seven week course, definitely. I'm definitely going to miss a class. <laughs> Just throw it out there. <laughs> there's an honest man. <laughs> you get Ken. Um, so um, attendance is mandatory, but we're recording it in case you miss. So don't worry about it. <laughs> uh, uh, Chaz pointed out that, uh, that contradiction that I was saying. Tennis is mandatory, but we're recording in case you miss it. <laughs> uh, so anyway, um, so what I'd like you to do um, is over the next um, week or so, if you could do the summaries while it's fresh in your mind, I would recommend doing it in the next week or so. Just try to look through your notes and sort of summarize. It doesn't have to be a novel. Just what were some of the, and it could be bullet points. What are the big things you learned each night, uh, each week? And then also, um, I'd love to hear suggestions from you of what courses you would really be interested in taking. Like rather than me throw out some suggestions, I'd rather you tell me, oh, this would be a cool course. I'd really love to see a course on this. And, um, you know, one last question just for me. Um, uh, I don't know how to ask this. Oh, it, when you, um, yeah, I'll do it this way. Instead of making you raise your hand now. I'm going to ask it this way. When you get, send back that last assignment, tell me if you'd be interested in taking an, another course. You know, so in other words, some of you may say, it's just one and done. I'm done with courses, homework, attendance. Uh, <laughs> and some of you may, that may be your attitude. Tell me if you're interested in taking it, because I'm kind of curious to see how it went over in terms of, oh, I'd really love to have another course, let me you know, take another course like this. or not so much <laughs> and that's either way is fine you can't offend me but i i really want to get some data on um you know how well it went, was received john but, i was very surprised they were all like really excited and said that they really want to take a systematic theology course <laughs> <laughs> so pastor uh liz and i were talking the other night and we just wanted to say that in the several different churches that we've been at, you know, in New York and New Jersey, so on and so forth. In the short time we're here, in less than a year, we've learned more in the Bible studies and in the courses than we've ever learned at any churches that we've attended. Because you go really in depth into the scripture, Amen. all the pastors, and and again, we just feel like we're home here with everybody here. So, thank you. Wow, wonderful. We love you too. Amen. What a way that what what a way to finish the last night. Um, that's great, Woody. I appreciate that. It's just uh, there's tingles all coming up and down my neck. You can't see them. So, uh, I do appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> Excluded from all homework now, he says. I dropped an apple off a little later too. <laughs> uh, Chaz, uh, thank you for being such a help tonight. Uh, and Chris, Pastor Chris, thank you for being here each week and. And throwing in um, your points, they make a, they really make a lot, a, a, they add a lot to the class. Thank you all for being so faithful in your attendance and your homework. They, I shared the homework with, um, with Chaz so he could read it as well. But, you know, the homeworks, you guys have done such a great job on the homework. I just loved reading it and, um, and just, it just uh, inspired me to read uh, your answers to the question um, really did a great job and uh, just meant a lot. I mean, obviously, a course like this, uh, you could have just mailed it in in some respects, but everybody took it seriously and it really showed in your homeworks. And uh, I just I can't say enough about how much I appreciate each and one of you. Um, I'd like to ask Chaz if he could, and, and DG, thank you so much for being there and helping with the microphones and you know, we are trying to keep everything. He's got, he's wiping down the microphone between talks. Uh, he, you know, we're trying to keep socially distanced. We, we got to 
you know, this Corona thing going around. Um, thank you for all your help, brother, in doing that. Um, Chaz, can you close us in a word of prayer? Sure. Let's pray, guys. Yeah. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that we have an opportunity to study your word as in, in depth. And Father, we're reminded by Hebrews 11:6. Father, you are a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And so, Father, the, the reward that we have received is the, the assurance of the hope that we have, Father. Yes. And, uh, just, just having a deeper understanding of our future forever home, Father, is so incredible. And, and we can't, the, the Bible is so clear that we can't completely fathom it, but you are so good and gracious that you, you give us inklings of what we can comprehend. And so, Father, even in, in our minuscule comprehension, it is, it is so incredible what, what, what you have in store for us. So, Father, we thank, thank you, you first and foremost for um, bringing us and counting us as your children, Father, and that you have uh, ordained for us to be in eternity with you, Father. And so we look forward to that day. And uh, we, we join with the apostles that say, come, Lord, come. Uh, Father, yes. we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. brother.